As C.S. Lewis says in one of his essays, the greed to be loved is a fearful thing. This quote encapsulates part one of Till We Have Faces perfectly. Part one focuses on the weaknesses of natural love and the dangers it can lead to if it's not submitted to divine love. Till We Have Faces is a novel which retells the Cupid and Psyche myth, but instead of Psyche telling her story, the sister Oral does, and in doing so corrects all the facts the original myth got wrong. For reference, Lewis has a man outside Psyche's temple in chapter 21 explaining the original myth, and it's also at the back of the book. It's important to point out that this novel is, is a myth, not an allegory. Lewis defines a good myth as a story out of which ever varying meanings will grow for different readers and in different ages. And thus for Lewis, as he explains in his letters, a myth is higher than an allegory. While an allegory can only portray that which a man knows, a myth can speak about what a man does not know. Myth, he states, is at best a real, though unfocused gleam of divine truth falling on human imagination. Lewis himself states regarding Till We Have Faces that much you take as an allegory was intended solely as realistic detail. Oral, for example, is not a symbol, but an instance. Therefore, while many people view the novel as an allegory for Christianity, it is not. Lewis did not believe that the pagan gods were bad, nor that pagan myths were entirely false. Instead, Lewis supported the view that those before Christianity still possessed partial truths about God, and that their myths reflected part of that truth. It doesn't take much to, much reading of famous ancient philosophers such as Aristotle and Plato to come to the same understanding. Therefore, this novel, while not an allegory for Christianity, still expresses profound truths about the nature of Christian love. Christianity as a whole is thus a major theme in the novel and can be noticed under the tiniest details. Other themes present within part one include distorted love, beauty and ugliness, and stoicism versus religious belief. In chapter one, we are introduced to the narrator, Oral, daughter of the King of Gloom. It is important to note here before we begin that Oral is not an entirely objective nor trustworthy narrator and her facts are not always facts. As Curtis Granella explains, Oral's story is told through a complex mixture of acquired objectivity, growing understanding and continued resentful self-deception. The story begins with Oral being the Queen of Gloom, but old, alone and bitter. She does not care for or have a fear of the gods anymore. She declares that her book would be an accusation against the gods, namely the god of the Great Mountain who wronged her and Psyche. Oral begins her story after her mother dies when she and Redival have their hair cut off. While people mourn the loss of Redival's beautiful locks, they see nothing about hers. This introductory story already hints at Oral's ugliness, despite Oral not realising she is ugly yet. After this, the fox is introduced into the story. He is sold as a slave to King Trump and given the task of teaching Oral and Redival. Again, Oral's ugliness is hinted at when the king says to the fox, see if you can make Oral wise, it's about all she'll ever be good for. During this first chapter, the theme of Stoicism versus religious belief or logic versus faith is introduced via conversations between Oral and the fox regarding the goddess Anjip. Fox does not believe in the gods, but the laws of nature and science. As a stoic, the fox rejects all miracles and mysteries and instead believes everything can be explained and understood through reason. The fox's beliefs have a drastic effect on orals, as we'll soon see. During this chapter, the king also gets engaged to a marriage of the princess of Kapad. During the same scene, Oral finally understands that she is ugly when the king tells the priest that Oral will be veiled at the wedding. He says, Do you think I want my queen frightened out of her senses? Veils, of course, and good thick veils too. Oral's knowledge of her physical ugliness plays a large role in how she sees herself and, and the world from this point on. As Carla Arnell points out, not only does Oral know she's ugly, but she's painfully aware of how, how beautiful others are by contrast. In chapter two, the king's new wife dies during childbirth, and unfortunately for the king, the child born is a girl, Istra, or in Greek, Psyche. This angers the king and causes him to fly into a violent rage. After this, Oral explains, it, explains all the happy times she had with Psyche before she was unjustly taken away from her. Oral becomes a mother-like figure to Psyche, and this is where the trouble begins. Psyche is even taught to call Oral Maya, which means mother. Oral's obsession with Psyche shows itself clearly when she says, I wanted to be a wife so that I could have been her real mother. I wanted to be a boy so that she could be in love with me. I wanted her to be my full sister instead of my half-sister. And I wanted her to be a slave so that I could set her free and make her rich. As Doris Myers explains, in each imagined role, Oral sees herself as a dominant one. Breaking this belief and allowing Psyche to be her own person will prove very difficult for Oral. Oral begins chapter three with a statement, it was Redival who ended the good time. It is clear from these words that Oral believes Redival is responsible for her losing her happiness, Psyche. And this is where the sequence of events which leads to it begins. As Myers explains, the attentive reader will note a discontinuity between actual events and Oral's evaluation of them. While Oral blamed Redival for Psyche eventually being sacrificed, it is not completely Redival's fault. The king, the priest, Bata and Psyche are all also partly to blame. Oral's accusation here, as Myers writes, establishes Oral as an unreliable narrator, thus modernizing the story with a modern, modern fictional technique. Oral states the year after her fight with Redifer was a bow for Gloam. The tide was against Gloam. The beginning of bad times for Gloam coincides with the people of Gloam beginning to worship Psyche as a goddess when she attempts to heal people from the fever. It is in this scene whereby the theme of Christianity concerning Psyche is heavily emphasized. Just like Jesus has a determination to go into the crowd to heal, so does Psyche. Whether Psyche can heal people is not of concern. Her motive behind healing appears as pure as Jesus. She says, let me go out. They are our people. In saying this, Mai is right. Psyche is Christ-like not a symbol for Christ. To say that Psyche is a Christ figure is a subtle distortion of the text. 
as Lewis himself explains, she is in some ways like Christ, not because she is a symbol of him, but because every good man or woman is like Christ. What else could they be like? Soon enough, Oral comes to learn that the fever has also gotten worse, not better, and that rather than the town people loving Psyche and believing that she can cure the fever, they believe that she spread it and are calling her the accursed. Oral's love for Psyche is possessive to the point where Oral believes she owns Psyche and thus can tell her what to do, and Psyche will simply follow. It is in this scene whereby Oral first notices that Psyche is beginning to become her own person, which Oral fights against for the majority of the rest of the book. When Oral tells Psyche that she had done wrong by going into the city, Oral realises that Psyche neither accepted the rebuke like a child nor defended herself like a child, but instead looked at Oral as if she were older than her. This, Oral states, gives her a pang at the heart. This is hinting at how possessive Oral's love is since she cannot bear to see Psyche as an independent woman. Soon after this, the fever clears up and the priest comes to visit the palace. During his visit, the priest explains that Anjit is angry, and this is the cause of Gloam's diminishing condition. The only way to remedy this is to find the accursed and sacrifice them in the great offering. This consists of giving the person to the brute, to lie with and devour, as they are viewed as almost the same thing. The brute is Anjit or Anjit's son. Interesting to note here that later on, Oral is likened to the brute by Anzit, Badia's wife. Oral is loving and devouring the same thing, just like the brute. The priest adds that the accursed must also be perfect. It is easy to notice here the similarity between the great offering and Christ's death on the cross. Both sacrifices had to be perfect, and also both are the sacrifice on a tree. The priest reveals that the curse is Psyche, and Oral instantly weeps and begs at the king's feet to spare Psyche, but he kicks her many times and throws her to the ground. She loses consciousness. During this scene, the fox and priest argue over the validity of the priest's words. The fox sees the contradictions in the priest's beliefs about who Anjit is and calls his beliefs nonsense. But the priest simply replies that Greek logic can't understand the mysteries of the gods. He says, Holy wisdom is not clear and thin like water, but thick and dark like blood. Oral is not convinced completely either way until she sees the priest utter calmness when the king threatens to kill him by pressing a dagger against his stomach. It is clear to Oral that the priest wholeheartedly believes in Anjit and does not fear death. This is a transformative moment for her. She comes to see what she believes to be superstition as possibly real. As Oral herself says, he was so sure of Anjit, I was sure too. Our real enemy was not mortal. Chapter 6 begins with Oral regaining her consciousness and asking to be sacrificed to the brute in Psyche's place. Instead of responding, the king leads her to a mirror, his very special mirror, which one can see their true image in. He forces Oral to look in it and says, Anjit asks for the very best in the land as her son's bride, and you'd give her that. While Oral does not say much straight after, this event does deeply affect her. It forms within her a deep-rooted fear of the mirror and hatred for her face. During part two, it is especially noticeable during her visions. Chapter 7 consists of a heated conversation between Oral and Psyche in Psyche's jail cell, which Bardi allowed Oral access to after she attempted to fight her way in. In this scene, Psyche's resemblance to Christ is made evident once again. Psyche acts similarly to Jesus and accepts her destiny gracefully. Her words even parallel Jesus when she forgives Redable for her betrayal, saying she also does what she does not know. Again, this is not done to establish Psyche as a Christ figure, but done to show an insight into the way the world is. It is simply what happens to good people in the real world, a place where there is no Aslan and no Merlin to rescue them. As Myers explained, the vivid unsettling resemblance between Psyche and Christ is not a mere trick of literary t technique, but the expression of a fundamental truth as Lewis sees it. Throughout this scene, Oral desperately desires Psyche to feel as sad as she does. It is as if Psyche's strength is a disappointment to Oral. Oral also can't accept that Psyche can love her and at the same time not be sorrowful about leaving her. Oral says the parting between her and me seemed to cost her so little. Psyche only causes Oral to become more distressed when she declares that she has always had a kind of longing for death, even when she was out of happiness. This hints that the sacrifice on the mountain is fated and that it will bring good, not evil. Again, Oral perceives this as Psyche not loving her and begins to get angry and lash out at Psyche, saying, I only see that you have never loved me. You are becoming cruel like the gods. Lewis describes Oral's possessive love for Psyche perfectly when he says, Oral is not a symbol, but an instance, a case of human affection in its natural condition. True, tender, suffering, but in the long run, tyrannically possessive and ready to turn to hatred when the beloved ceases to be its possession. What such, such love particularly cannot stand is to see the beloved passing into a sphere where it cannot follow. Of course, I had always in mind is close parallel to what is probably going on in at least five families in your own town at the moment. Someone becomes a Christian or in a family nominally Christian already, does something like becoming a missionary or entering a religious order. The others suffer a sense of outrage. What they love is being taken from them. Instantly after leaving Psyche, Oral passes out and awakens sore and stiff and on the morning of Psyche's sacrifice to see Psyche dresses a temple girl before passing out ill again. Whilst Oral is sick, she has nightmares of Psyche, which she contends is a god's doing. In all the nightmares, Psyche is her enemy in one way or another. As Hood explains, a good reader should understand that these dreams are not from the gods, but are truths from Oral's subconsciousness, which she refuses to recognise. Oral does, in fact, view Psyche as an enemy, in the sense that Psyche is no longer obedient to her and she must bring her back under her control. It is at this point that the reader realises that Oral's love for Psyche is truly dangerous and is not one of excess, but one of defect. As MacDonald says in The Great Divorce, natural affection, like Oral's, is a stronger angel and therefore when it falls, a stronger devil. Nine, Barty and Oral decide to bury Saki's bones together 
and thus they begin the journey to the mountain to do so. Whilst close by the house of Unjet, Oral feels distressed, but once they pass it, she begins to feel hope and happiness and can't even believe her own ugliness. Why is this, by the way? She's angry at herself for this. Again, this shows Oral's warped idea of love. She believes if she can experience happiness without Psyche, it means she never loved her. She says herself, was I not right to struggle against this full happy mood? I would not go laughing to Psyche's burial. If I did, how should I ever again believe that I had loved her? Soon after this, they find the tree Psyche was tied to, but no body. And then finally, they see Psyche herself standing in a green luscious valley across the river, the God's Valley. Oral notices that Psyche is dressed in rags, but appears happy, already suggesting that Oral may not be able to see the divine world that Psyche does. Psyche helps Oral across the river, which appears to be that which divides the human world from the divine. Psyche brings Oral some berries and water to eat, which Psyche calls a banquet and wine. As they speak, Psyche tells Oral the story of the sacrifice, but all Oral is focused on is taking Psyche back to going with her and thus constantly interrupts her. Again, in this, Oral's possessive love for Psyche is clear. Psyche soon enough reaches the point in her story whereby she saw the god of the West Queen that entered the Divine Palace. From this point onward, it only goes downhill as Oral cannot believe that Psyche saw a god. This situation is almost identical to that which occurs in The Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe, where Susan and Peter cannot believe that Lucy went to Narnia. There are only three possibilities, either Lucy or Psyche in this case, is telling lies, or she is mad, or she is telling the truth. But Oral knows Psyche to be honest and does not appear mad. Therefore, she must be telling the truth, but despite this, Oral cannot believe her. Oral alludes to the reason as to why when she says, if this is all true, I've been wrong all my life. Everything has to be begun over again. This links to the irreligious lesson she has always learned from the fox. It's just after this that the climax of the first part of the novel comes. Oral tells Psyche, Psyche to show her the palace, but Psyche replies, but this is it, Oral. It is here. You are standing on the stairs of the great gate. Psyche into this point has been unaware that Oral cannot see the palace and Oral has been unaware that Psyche's talk of her banquet and wine was literal. It is from this point onwards that Oral begins to passionately hate the gods. This is because she perceives that the gods have separated them from one another and stolen Psyche from her. This is the key difference between the original myth and Lewis's. As Lewis writes, In my own version, it consists in making Psyche's palace invisible to normal mortal eyes. If making is not a wrong word for something which forced itself upon me, almost at my first reading of the story, as the way the thing must have been seen. In Lewis's version, Oral cannot see the palace because she does not truly believe in the divine. She is still caught between the fox's beliefs and the priest, between the rational discourse and religious belief. Another part of the reason why she cannot see the palace is simply because she does not want to. Accepting the gods means accepting that Psyche is happy without her, which Oral cannot be the thought of. It also means accepting that she will have to share Psyche with someone other than herself, which again, is unbearable for her. This leads me on to my questions. What difference does it make that the novel is first person narrated? In most of Lewis's other works, there is a third person narrator. Why do you think he changed the narrator for this novel? Secondly, why is the tension between reason slash stoicism versus religion slash superstition so important to the story? How does each relate to Christianity or the true religion? Thirdly, when it is revealed that Oral cannot see Saki's palace, it automatically makes sense as to why in the reader's mind without it being specifically stated. How does Lewis achieve this?